All right, thanks for showing up. This is a short session with a long title. Uh, I'm Nicholas from Square Moon. We're going to talk about managing multiple data files uh, with dynamic data sources. And I say we because I expect you guys to, uh, to have questions and uh, smart ideas. We're going to talk, I'm going to talk about the way we set this up uh, in a way that works for us. So hopefully it will inspire, but also give us some pushback on, on things we could do better. All right. Uh, first, shortly about why we're doing this. And also how, of course. We're going to jump into some technical slides. I'm not going to show any code, uh, any working software. I'm just going to talk about this theoretically. Uh, so we're going to talk about the FileMaker files we use and how we establish the connection to the right file, basically. Uh, that's the main thing. Considerations, of course, stuff we learned on the way, uh, what you need to think about and what's not working and what's, what's working but with a, with a tweak or so that's needed. Uh, if we have the time, we'll talk shortly about how we manage DevOps to deploy uh, from different environments to get all those to get all the code out to different uh, data files. And hopefully we have time for some questions at the end. So why are we doing this? Um, we have a client who sells an application, uh, a vertical solution, for many customers. So basically each customer uh, uses the application as their own application. And it's, it's all the same for everyone who uses it. Uh, but since, and, and those are different law firms managing uh, bankruptcy estates or konkursbun, as we say in Swedish. So each law firm has a high need uh, to have their data separated from all the other law firms, of course. Uh, we've experienced some difficulties using the record level security in FileMaker uh, at scale. I see people nodding. It's not, not the best uh, thing for security. And also quite a lot of limitations on how you handle the UI when you have 10,000 records and 2,000 are yours. And yeah, we need to split that up. It's, it's not really a good way to go. Uh, we also want to share a lot of resources. So we want to share the full UI. Since it's just one application, we see no need for having different UIs to the different customers. And also, there's a lot of shared data that is more or less public. So we have a lot of integrations pulling data from different services. Uh, and we had a lot of settings that we all use the same. We have a lot of template data and such. Uh, so we don't, have mul we don't want to have multiple instances of all that shared data. I hope that makes sense. So what FileMaker files do we use? <clears throat> Basically, it looks like this. So we have the shared UI that all the users log into the same UI file. We have a shared data file, the yellow one, that are all those common uh, assets that everyone can read. So it's typically read-only in that file. It is read-only. The, the user can never write to the shared data. And we have, in this case, just a symbolic four different data files, where each block, each data file, of course, is for one one client or one instance, as we call it. So this is the basic setup. And the dynamic external data source comes in at the dotted line, as everybody already read on screen. How many have used this feature to set a dynamic data source? Quite a few. Cool. We have some more files as well on top of this. We have a system file that are running uh, integrations and tasks at the server. Uh, no graphical UI on that one. And we have an admin file for like a super admin to uh, define and register a new customer and users for such an instance. That's also where we get uh, the unique and random file name for each instance. It's generated uh, when you register a new law firm. And in the real world, it looks something like this. Just to give you a feel of what it actually looks like when we're working with this. So we have now we have 60 plus uh, law firms running this application. So there's a lot of files on the server. 
And there's a lot of files in the server admin uh, console. But we, we don't touch them too much, so it's not really a problem, even if it looks intimidating. So how do we establish the connection? Well, you had already used this feature in FileMaker. I'm not sure what version this came out. Anyone remember? 17? Something like that. Well, basically what we do, this is the normal external data source dialog, right? So we reference a global variable, and in that global variable, we'll have the file name. It's basically as simple as that. And in this case, we just state it very obviously in the name of that data source that it's customer specific. So that's clear to each user because when you choose tables from different files, you really want to know which one is the shared and the, and the customer specific. And it doesn't really matter, of course, what the data source is called. Uh, but the trick is to set the right data file in that global variable, right, when the user logs in. So I'm going to talk briefly about how we do that. And this is a way to try to illustrate it. So all users are known within the application. So each user has their, uni their unique FileMaker account, just as we're used to. So in the UI file, the green one, we have all the accounts for all the known users. Same thing goes for the shared data file. A long list of users, hundreds of users. But in the data file, we have a subset of that. So each user working on a specific law firm has only their account in that specific data file related to that law firm. Makes sense, right? So when we log in, we, we use it, we log in common as we do in FileMaker, step one. And the first thing that, that happens when you log into the UI file, we have a script and we also have a table within that file. So except for the, a central user table, a very small one, just a couple of fields, and a central table for each law firm, there's no, really no data in the UI file. But we keep them stored in that file particularly to be able to run a script with full access when you log in. So the data in that file is really locked down, so no one has uh, readable access in those tables. But we grant the, the, the start, startup script full access to be able to, in that moment when you log in, uh, to get my account name using the get account name function, to find my specific user record in that central table. And of course, by doing so, I can fetch the related value of what's the name of my uh, data file, because that's stored on my, on my company record, basically, which is not in this sketch. So after we've done that, we can start communicating with the external data that is customer specific. We can't do it before, of course, since FileMaker wouldn't know. And, and this is one of the considerations that you need to think about, because as soon as FileMaker finds a reference to a data file, it will ask for that file if it's missing. So it will show you a really ugly dialog box, and if that's shown, the user wouldn't know where to go, click cancel, and it all breaks. And this is true even if we, as developers, start to debug a script, and it starts running the first steps, and we have steps further down, the data, the debugger wants to show us what a field is called in a reference data file. So if that global variable isn't set really early on, we even as developers will run into problems. So one key thing here is really to set the global variable early before the user or the application really reads or writes any data. So it must be really, the data file must be hidden from the application before that is set, basically. Does that make sense? So once it's set, it works like any other uh, file that is part of a multi-file solution. You log in automatically with your name and password, and which is the same in that specific customer data file. And also, we have a user table that is more local to the user, because we still want the user to be able to change their name, uh, change their email address, whatever it is, and have their, their local settings. 
So from, we really just use the central table at, at the logging sequence. And of course, uh, the yellow one, the shared data, we log in the user automatically, or FileMaker sorts that out for us, as we're used to. Any questions so far? Awesome. Yeah, shoot. Yeah, um, your management of the central user table and the user table there, uh, are you controlling the, I'm assuming that central user table is native to the user UI or is that in the data shared? The central one? The, the central one. Yes, it's native to the user to UI. To the user file, yes. okay, so your data, you're holding data in the UI. Yes. Um, how are you synchronizing across, because you're saying you're using uh, user record in the data file from then on. Yes. But are you managing that through scripting to populate that from the central file? Yes. So you're, you're, you're floating, effectively calling scripts within the various files to maintain them yes. together. Okay, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about how we, we do those script calls because that's becoming a problem, right? We have now 65 data files and we want to change something centrally in what file because I'm not the customer. So from a central standpoint, when we're here, and typically work in the admin UI, yeah, well, if we're firing a script to do something in a data file, what data file? So, but I'll return to that. Yes, Klaus. External authentication is probably not possible, but have you considered what to do? Yes. Yes and yes. Uh, <laughs> that's the short answer. No, external authentication is a problem. But I'm hoping for some of you guys to have a smart solution to this, but the problem with external authentication is not that it's not working, uh, but it's very server centralized, right? So in the FMS admin console, you specify what external service you use for authentication. So if we have <coughs> 10 out of 60 law firms that wants to have external authentication. How do we solve that? I know you one maybe has some ideas that we haven't really discussed yet, but I'm happy to hear if you have uh, suggestions. Yes. Um, so I did a session on OData this morning. A couple of your guys were there. You need to talk to them about maybe abstracting some of the central user table out to OData would really help you because the user can also write back to their record, but they don't have to have any link to the file. Talk to you after about. It just strikes me as that's a use case that I think potentially could be explored. So you're not holding any data in the UI file, you're holding the data somewhere else. Makes um, sense. In a user's table, yeah. uh, using OData to do it. Yeah, thanks. And also just a comment on why uh, the central user table is within the UI file because it doesn't really make sense to have a data table in the UI file. But that's just for convenience to be able to run the startup script within that file with full access. Because even if you grant a script full access, in one, that's just in that file. So if you have an external data source, it doesn't really honor that. Yes. Some considerations. And we have uh, Klaus, you're, you're running ahead. We already talked about that one and got some good ideas. Thank you. One thing, I've, all you that raised your hands before, the first thing you probably noticed when you start playing with this is that the thing you set in the global variable first time and then use it, that you're stuck with what was in the global variable at that point. So you can empty it or you can set it to something else within that same session and it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't connect to a new data file. That's just the way FileMaker works, and I, I guess it's something, it, it probably makes sense from a technical and a logical standpoint. But that's something you need to keep in mind. So you basically need to shut the files down to, to restart. Also, since each user has their account in the, both the UI and the shared data file, 
they need to have unique usernames. So we're just using their email address to solve that, basically. But that's something you need to be aware of, of course. Uh, manipulating data, as I said, it's, it's not really it's a bit scary to keep all your data scattered in this way in different files. Of course, it's structured, but if we have, uh, if we run upon a bug because the field isn't set or we have some settings or anything, yes. Yeah, I'm sorry for. I have a, a quick comment on unique usernames. Yeah. Uh, in this kind of a scenario, I use a single login uh, for all users. Goes, it fetches the data, and then we can parse everything for for each of the user. So it works out. So I don't need to, to have uh, unique usernames for everyone in all in all files. You have a single. Sorry, I didn't really catch that. Uh, you have a single user. I call it the cross cross file user. I, I just have it uh, in an open script. Uh, I relog into that user get the data from the shared files, get back, and then log in uh, with the correct user. Ah, OK, so you log in without the username first, with the generic user? Yeah, oh? you, you yeah. log in, but then in a script, you re-log in to the other one, and then you get the data and the data source file name. You re-log in back to the correct username. To just shut it down. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks. Uh, okay, the bug scenario. We have a field that is not set properly. Yes, it's a lot of work to open each file when you have start to reach a certain limit of files, of course. There's quite a lot of ways to do that. We have occasionally, we've been having, we had the need to do that, to fix something really quickly. If we can deploy a new version, we could set up scripts to fix stuff, but if you're in a live uh, production environment, you need to fix something, that might happen. But it's not optimal. But what we use quite a lot is uh, FMP URLs to call scripts uh, within the data file. So from a central file where we know we have a table for all the law firms, right? all the customers. We know their files. So we can build uh, the specific FMP URL to call the specific files. And we can have some generic scripts that does a read, finds something dynamically in a dynamically uh, specified table and do that to write stuff as well, of course. And we can just run that in a loop to fire uh, and start a script in each, each of those files. That are some drawbacks to that. Uh, error trapping is not super simple because you don't get the, the normal script result back. You basically just fire and forget. But that can be solved to write something back to a shared place, of course. But that's the way we use to, uh, to maintain data when we need to. And of course, we could probably use the data API to do such a call, maybe even e in an even better way than using FMP URL. But it works, it works pretty good. You one is nodding. <laughs> and of course, when you're looping through all those files, uh, you soon get quite keen on storing your user credentials to not be able, not have to enter your username and password for each file. Uh, and that could be done, of course, but should be done with care. We use that, we just store them in a global variable, so it's passed in the FMP URL, then you can just kill that variable when you're done. Something to be aware of. Yes, uh, server-side scripts, of course, are troublesome running in the data file, as we're used to, because we don't want to uh, set up a new script for each data file uh, each time we deploy a new instance. So in order to do that, we need to do, we, we actually managed to avoid server-side scripts um, altogether in this application. But of course, you could do it using uh, the same technique with looping FMP URLs. But I, I would expect that to work on the server as well. No? Fabrice, no? Ah, true. Yeah, so it, you use the API for that. So you call the API because then you can use the variable of your database, actually. Yes. So you can set up a server file sorting everything out for you. Yeah, that's it. To point that out in an external file? 
Okay. If you didn't hear what Fabrice said, it, you could use the set uh, perform script by name to sort this out. Cool. Um, and running perform script on server is also a bit different because when you fire a, a Pesos script on the server, that session needs to be aware of what data file is used as well. Yes, Vince. Yes. Yes. Yes, <laughs> that's true, yes. Uh, so the first thing, Scandinavia is quite small, so they're all <laughs> pretty close to the server. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the second one for custom features, it's pretty simple. We, we don't offer any custom features. <laughs> yes. Um, yes, running perform script on server. So basically we do the same mechanism as I just showed you. Uh, so each time a, a perform script on server starts to run, the same startup sequence will run to make sure that the global variable is set, because that doesn't exist on the server, right, when that session starts. So that's something we need to be aware of. And actually, and this is really a parenthesis, but we've noticed recently that if a user logged into this application, they're prompted to change their password because they just error temporary at first. And if they change that password and then start a perform script on server, that will fail due to account name or password doesn't match. Is that familiar to anyone? No. It, it seems like it started in 19.5. When you close the file and then log in again, it works as it should. So it's just like the password is stored and cached uh, within FileMaker. And when you change it using scripts, that cache isn't updated in some way. OK, I'll be happy to talk more if someone has ideas about this. Yes. And external authentication, yes, that is a problem. Questions so far? OK, we'll talk briefly about DevOps. Uh, we're quite heavy users of Otto from Proofgeist. And in this scenario, we use it for two things. So when I mentioned we're not uh, hanging around in the admin console too much, and it's basically because we use this tool quite a lot. I guess most people are familiar, but, but what Otto does, it, it sort of wraps uh, a tool around the data migration tool to automate uh, pausing of databases, moving clones, migrating data, and then launching them on, on a new server again. Uh, so, the first thing, when we get a new client, we use Otto to copy uh, a master file, because we always have, of course, one master file to keep our development in, that is then branched out to all the environments. So in this, in this one you can see, this is, uh, you see that the topmost is uh, selected, deploy, new data file in production. And this is the sign in auto for copy. So what we use is the copy function to just copy one file on the same server and give it a new name. That's basically it. And it's very convenient. We just press play. Auto will pause a master file, create a new one, give it the right name, and then launch both files again, like that. So we don't have to log into the servers, which is very practical. Uh, the other thing is to deploy files uh, from a staging environment to a production environment. 
And here it helps really a lot, since we're running more than 60 files uh, at this stage each time we update production. And you can see in, in the list to the left, yeah, sorry, I blurred this for, for customers' uh, sake, uh, but we have basically one master file, that's the same file, which is the source, and then the target is the file we are uh, creating on or migrating in the production environment. It takes 10 to 15 minutes to run a full migration from one server to another, which really helps. That's about it. Yeah, a couple, couple of things. Um, first of all, it was FileMaker 16, where the dynamic uh, external 16. data source comes um, Are you running encryption on, at rest on all of those files? Yes. And you're using the same password for all those different files? Yes. Yeah, OK. But Maybe, but yes. But yeah, it's, it would be unmanageable for that number of files. Yeah. With encry encryption at rest needs so much work on. OK. Um, We've got a similar scenario which has not been activated yet. We've got a UK-based system with four data, f uh, three data files and one UI file, and then it's a replica for a US system. It's hosted in the UK, and I've play. I've, I've done nothing more than play with it, so it's not active. But I was planning to have a re-login facility for the user because I've got management or directors who need access to the US system and the UK system, so. We're going to use scripts that would take the user to a, in the UI file, as effectively a re-login page. So we'd run the scripts to log them out of each one. Have you, have you played at all with the re-login facility to, so that somebody doesn't have to exit the actual, you no, clear the I'm, global field? I'm afraid it wouldn't help for the, for the dynamic data source, if, if that's what you're coming for. So you wouldn't be able to clear any, ver you've got to exit, there's there's no way, because I've, I've actually done it on local files mm -hmm. successfully, but I, 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 as I say, I haven't put it into a production environment. I, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm, I'm quite certain that that data sort that is defined will still stick, and you will have a problem closing that data file window, even if you use re-login. Okay. But I know that there are, and you please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but I know there are some, some tricks made uh, in the GoSync app that have sort of the same issue, where you have a problem closing, closing a window since you have references, closing a file because you have references to it. Yeah. And they solve that with some intermediate file uh, so they're still able to close yes, that file I did, out. I did have an intermediate file. That's that's absolutely correct. It yeah. Wasn't, yeah. Yeah. That's right. We exited the files, reverted to the intermediate file, which is the login file. Yes. That's that's right. Sorry, this was a year ago. So. Yeah. 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 That yeah. will work. I'm also considering, as I've only got two two separate data sets of just running the UI file and updating the two together yeah, yeah. as well. Yeah. It's a solution as okay, well. Okay. Thanks. Just to tell you that we've got a similar solution, not lawyers, with architects, and we have a server where we host uh, about 30, 35 data files, all similar. And but we have a UI file, of course, but it's local on the machine of the user. And there is a very small um, public file that. Uh, that's the data file name, logs into the data file, all users log into the data file and, uh, and opens the data file in hidden mode and then uh, opens the UI file with the generic password that's not consequential. So I think in my look it was with less hassle than, than uh, the way you Are you able to switch data source uh, without closing down all of the files? 
Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's another way of doing it. We should work. I would be not maybe not too worried, but a bit worried to expose the name of the data file in a local file that is distributed. But that depends on the scenario, of course. No, no. Yes, it's it's not a question but a remark. We are using almost the same technique, but not to connect to files named differently, the same files named differently as you do, but we connect to the same file on different servers. All ah, right. Yes. So it's almost the same logic, but yeah, it but works well. <laughs> and uh, we just change the host name and we, so maybe for another use case, yes. it might work. So it might interest also yeah, others people. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. And also for us, because we keep getting more more instances in the solution so it's that's a way to scale as well to in include just include a server path yeah. within that so yeah it's a good point yeah indeed there are so many use cases such as uh, test and, uh, prod and so on uh, one that was uh, very interesting uh, was the fact that we could have uh, developers um, developers not accessing the client's data. In, in so many instances, it, we take it for granted that uh, when you have full access over a FileMaker solution, you access the customer data. And in some uh, contexts, it's a real issue. So you can really work with a database um, with your development uh, data and then guarantee the customer that you you don't you cannot read his uh, that's one thing and I just wanted to um, ask if you um, tried to run the the uh, UI locally and uh, that's uh, what uh, Vince showed earlier and it's really efficient in that type of architecture have you tried that no we haven't tried it in this with this application but it would be interesting to do indeed you think it would it for performance reasons? Yeah. 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 Yeah, but also we we need to run that without accounts in that file, right? So our architecture would need to be a bit different. But uh, yeah, yeah, it's a good point. And also, I think you're really correct on we will see more customers who would demand that a full uh, developer team don't gain access to all their data. So yeah. So external authentication, you could uh, charge more for the customers who want to use that and then set up a server yes. where uh, they just log in and then access the files that are located on other servers. You get that? No. So you have a central system server, your server with the shared data and your management stuff. And then uh, on, on their server that is set up with external authentication, they log in there and from there they can access uh, shared assets login yes yep. for sure that's that's one way to go that's very very Thanks. tricky when it comes to getting through different firewalls and things like that but that's the one way yeah definitely we got two more questions and then we need to wrap up for, for this one yep hi. hi i actually wanted to have a thought experiment regarding external authentication as well what you could do is having people externally authenticate your ui file there you can get their account name and using OData you create that account actually using the server in the UI file and in the data file. Yeah. You generate some random password so your user will, your FileMaker user will exist only for that session then you do re-login in UI and then you access your data file, huh? so it should all work. You probably would have to see that uh, the timing is right. As you mentioned, probably the login don't, doesn't propagate well between server and client. We would have to uh, test that. Yeah. And then at the end of the session, you just delete that user, 
uh, your uh, email address stays, all your uh, maintenance fields get properly marked. Yeah. And you would probably want to have to do that at the start as well. First, try to delete the user. So yeah, th in case it, it stays hanging up. Yeah. But that should actually work, yeah. I think. It's a good point. Thank you. So <clears throat> with security, yes, there's overhead in performance. Uh, just curious if the overhead that you noticed when you were trying to set up uh, record level access security, uh, was it because like there, there's difference, there's differences in the, in the way you set it up and there's more impact on performance and less impact. So uh, like were you setting it up in such a way that you were querying the related data saying if this record is equal to the related data in this other table? Or how, how like, because I, I've noticed like, like even at the simplest level, there's like a 30% performance impact on, on, on you know, re just showing delivering the, the data just yeah. because you've got security. There's that overhead to, to filter it out, to make sure of that, but it, it can get even worse. Like depending on how complex your calculation is and all that, right? It yeah. can be even 50% or more. Yeah. yeah, yeah. this was quite a couple of years ago. I don't know if you remember, Marcus, but I think we mainly ran into trouble when we had uh, SQL uh, queries, because that was new. We used that for everything. And we had some scenarios where that just went a thousands of percents to run a simple SQL query. We couldn't it was at first, but then when we didn't log in with full access, it just broke down. So it's a, a quite an old experience, but as you say, we, we just keep that in mind that it's it's a quite an extra overhead. Yeah, true. Yeah, there's a lot of things to talk about security there, but yeah, we, we're going to have to thank uh, Nicholas for his presentation now. <laughs> thank you.